So my name is uh, Jason Leaf. I work uh, with the National Immigration Forum um, as a mobilizer, a BBB mobilizer in Iowa, Wisconsin, and Missouri. And we are here today with Alex Vasquez. Now, Alex, uh, you and I have a history. Uh, mm -hmm. You were a student of mine way back when. Uh, and now we kind of, we kind of, you know, try to work together as much as we possibly can on, on some things. But uh, maybe why don't you start by just kind of saying, you know, what, you, what you're doing right now. Uh, what is it you're doing here in Sioux Center? Yeah. Like Jason said, my name is Alex Vasquez. I uh, lead a nonprofit and ministry called Young Life here in Sioux County. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what I do as an occupation. Yeah. And how long have you been doing that? I am pretty close to two years now. Nice. So, um, so yeah, it's coming up. Nice. Well, why don't we start by just having you, well, let me set the context. So part of the context of this is the Supreme Court is making a decision uh, on, on DACA, a Deferred Action Childhood Arrival. Uh, the Supreme Court is deciding whether the Trump administration's trying to rescind the program is constitutional and, and so on. And so that decision is hopefully going to be coming out soon. Um, and so I, I'm kind of curious to hear your story and kind of get your input on the Supreme Court decision that's coming up. So why don't you start by just kind of briefly telling your story? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Jason. Um, so my story begins I, in, in Colombia, the country of Colombia. I was born there. Uh, when I was about five years old, my family had to leave the country because of violence. And we migrated to the United States in 2000, I believe. I was about the year, I was about five years old. And uh, when we came, we, we came here legally on temporary visas, um, not knowing of what the future would hold. Uh, but my parents made a decision to stay in the United States, um, fleeing from the violence and, and hoping for the American dream, hoping that there would be a way of being able to uh, achieve that. Um, my parents, from a very young age, uh, told me that education and going about things the right way would be the way to earning um, a place here in the United States. So I remember my mom teaching me to pay for taxes at a young age and, and getting a job at an early age and uh, making sure that my grades were on top. So I did that for um, most of my um, childhood. And in 2017 or 18, I believe, uh, somewhere around there, DACA came out. And this was the first time that I would be represented uh, for, in the government. And although I was given DACA, uh, I didn't know that I didn't qualify for FAFSA or financial help from the government. So when I applied for colleges and, and financial aid, uh, I wasn't able to receive help. So I ended up going to a private school education, uh, worked year round, and it was because of DACA that I was able to get a license. I was able to get um, a social security uh, to be represented. And so DACA in a lot of ways really laid out the foundational work that I needed to get an education. Mm -hmm. Now, I, because of that, I've been able to graduate from a four-year degree or get a four-year degree uh, and be able to work here legally here in the United States. Mm. So that's kind of my DACA story in, in a sense. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, you kind of touched on this, but what, uh, what then, how would you respond to the question, you know, what does DACA mean to you? What is the importance of DACA for you? Yeah, well, DACA is very important, Jason. I most of my life I was uh, called and really uh, registered in the United States as an illegal alien. Uh, that was a time of fear in my life, of, of confusion. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what I, I was entitled to. Uh, there was a lot of fear. DACA gave me a representation. Now, the legal term is a authorized alien, right? So it still has a sense of um, degrading a uh, name to it, but at least it represents me, right? Sure. It gives me a sense of, okay, well, I'm not, I don't technically belong here, but there, there's a sense of like, hey, we we're allowing you to stay here. Yeah. Um, for me, it, it's hard. It's a hard and touchy subject just because I didn't have a choice when I was at a, when I was, when I was, uh, 
five years old. I didn't know what it, the stakes, I didn't know what breaking the law meant. But what I did know is that my family sacrificed everything. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to be here in the United States. Uh, so DACA for me is super important. Uh, it, it provides a, an opportunity for me to dream about what's next and be able to provide and, and contribute back to the community that I love. Yeah. And, and so how are you feeling about this, the, possi you know, the possibility of a Supreme Court decision, which is, is coming here soon? Um, how are you feeling about that possibility that DACA may be kind of struck down by the Supreme Court? It's a scary thing. I, you know, you can only push it aside as much as you can, but it's still weighing on a lot of our shoulders. Uh, I, I know that when I first thought about it, it was a no brainer, right? For me, uh, in order to get DACA, you couldn't get in trouble. You had to have a whole bunch of, of requirements. You had to show that you're involved in the community in school. And there's a bunch of legal fees. You had to put money into this. So for me, it was like the top of the top, get to get, you know, get received DACA. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was no, no brainer. You know, the United States is, is allowing wonderful and, and achieving people in the, in the United States that are striving for jobs, that are striving for education and doing a lot of good things. So for me, it was like, why wouldn't they allow these students and, and people to have a pathway to citizenship? Now, getting more educate, educated on it, I do understand that there was laws that were, were you know, were broken and as far as my family goes. but. Um, I would really love to see something, a reconciliation, something, a process of like, even if we have to have a fee or, or a pathway to it, but being in the standstill and unknowing like what comes next, it is tough because this is the country that I know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, Colombia is, is a country that my parents grew up in, but I, I have no recollection or I have no understanding of what a, living in the country of Colombia looks like or what it feels like. So this is all I know. Yeah. So what, what is your hope? Um, you know, either the, um, you know, the Supreme Court will come back and say, no, we're going to keep DACA or they're going to strike it down and push it back to, you know, the Congress to try to try to do something. What do you see as the best possible outcome? Yeah, well, the, the best possible outcome and, and what I'm hoping for is a, a, a pathway to citizenship. Uh, I think that's the dream that everyone has. You know, the, there has to be a sense of uh, immigration reform. And I think this is the best way to start. You know, a lot of these people have uh, technically earned their way to be working citizens uh, here. So uh, creating a pathway for that would be, in my, in my opinion, the best. Um, but it is also a very scary thing that they would just shut down DACA, the one thing that is representing me here. Yeah. So uh, I, I think creating a pathway to citizenship, however that looks like it, I believe is the best way um, towards that. And to, to piggyback off that a little bit, do you get a sense of people in the immigrant community who have DACA or, or people that you know, is there a lot of palpable kind of anxiety about what might possibly happen? Yeah, what well, I you know, there's a lot of colleagues of mine that actually even in ministry that I work with that uh, make up a, quite a bit of the Hispanic population within our ministry that have DACA. You know, this this would not just only be a a heavy blow for us and our families, but for our organizations and ministries and companies, um, it it is um, you don't know what's coming next. Yeah. So, it is something that weighs on our head and it's something that we're, we're praying about a lot. Okay. Um, what would you say to somebody who really doesn't understand what's at stake here? And we're talking about uh, citizens of the U S who maybe haven't really educated themselves on the issue. And, and so they're just kind of sitting back going, well, wait a minute, I don't quite understand what, what would be one thing you would want to communicate? Well, Jason, uh, I think some people believe that a lot of these topics are black and white. And I, I believe the people who say and believe these things are people who are not uh, experiencing it. They don't live and they don't breathe. They don't know people who are, who are going through this. 
you know? So um, when I talk to a lot of my friends that had no, have no idea of what DACA is and they understand my story, they, they learn that there's a possibility that I might become illegal here in the next couple months, something starts to change in their mind. And mm. what I would love people to know is that the, you know, there, there's a lot of hardworking people that would want a chance, that would want an opportunity uh, to, to contribute. That's it. To, mm. to, to walk alongside and, and to be a part of the community, to be a part of, of what's going on. And it's not so black and white. Uh, yeah. because we, we've worked our tails off. And in, in my story, I've been living here uh, for 20 plus years. Mm. And, uh, you know, a lot of the people who I've grown up with, the people who I've, you know, st stood next to and done the Pledge of Allegiance and, and you know, my, my friends that, you know, that had done my taxes for me or I, I helped them with their taxes, we are doing the same thing. And this is all I know. Mm. Uh, so for, for them to understand that, someone like me who hasn't gotten in trouble, has done everything by the books and, and has done everything possible, um, could be looking at my whole life changing and mm. my whole family as a whole would be devastated and our whole life would change if, if I would then become illegal. Yeah. Uh, so it, there's a lot of stake. Personally, yeah. uh, my family, my, the ministry that I work for, the company or community, there's a lot at stake. And I would just love for people to, to ask and, and find out, you know, why, how would this affect them and what it would look like if they were in my shoes? No, that's good. That's good. Um, so kind of a last question here that maybe moves away from DACA, but uh, during this kind of COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, what uh, kind of, of issues or fears or concerns have, have you run across? Um, within the community, uh, within the immigrant community, within those who, you know, are citizens, with those maybe who are undocumented, uh, are there particular fears that they have? Jason, as an immigrant, there's already fear. Um, you know, you're already living in fear. And with this, this COVID-19, there's an, an added layer of fear, of, of uncertainty, of unknowing what, what comes next, and not knowing what um, is... Uh, what you're, a, you're able to receive, right? Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of families that I've been working with and people who I've, I know are fearful of just telling someone that they need help, mm -hmm. um, not knowing exactly how to go about asking for help. You know, there's a language barriers for some of the families where, uh, you know, school is sending out emails and, and parents don't know, have no idea what, you know, is in store for the kids. Uh, as far as food goes, there's, there's families that um, usually would come into offices, you know, and say, hey, uh, we need help with groceries and not knowing what phone, like what, uh, where to call yeah. to ask for help. So there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of fear. And uh, where, as in like one of us, we could go on Facebook or go on, look on, on the internet, you know, and, and find out what exactly... Yeah is going on that some of those things are not um, something that is, is accessible to some of the families that I'm working with. So it's been kind of a struggle to kind of, you know, first um, try to get in touch with them, right? Because, yeah. you know, I could be, you know, jumping on Zoom with you right now, you know, um, and doing that with a family that, um, yeah, it's just, this is not the most accessible to all families that we're wanting to work with. Right. No, that's, that's a great perspective. I think, you know, every, everybody has been totally disrupted by, uh, by this, by this COVID thing. But um, from what I've experienced, it seems to be making those who are already vulnerable, even more vulnerable uh, because of some of the very things that you brought up. Well, Alex, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk about these, uh, these issues, these important issues. Um, it's been great to work with you and hopefully we can kind of keep, keep working together, but I wish you, you know, God's blessing during this COVID time. I hope you, um, can stay healthy, uh, and, uh, we'll see what happens with the Supreme Court. Yeah. I appreciate it, Jason. All right. Thanks. See ya. Thank you.